Hi, I'm Sataj Hans and you're listening to Sorry Partner. Hello and welcome to Sorry Partner, a weekly podcast about bridge and all things interesting to bridge players. Brought to you by Bridge Partners and Friends, Catherine Harris and Jocelyn Starts. On today's program, we talk with Australian champion Sataj Hands about deception versus complexity, decision fatigue, and how to tackle cheaters head on. Plus, he shares his top tip for developing players. But first, let's give it. Hi, partner. Hi, Catherine. How are you? Jocelyn, I'm really well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, but you know, I have to get going pretty soon because I am going off to play bridge. I'm off to go play that game with a new partner. Yeah, that's right. I'd forgotten about that, of course. So um, yeah. are you all set? Well, I hope so. I mean, I'm as set as I'm going to be. It's been quite a process getting aligned on our convention card, as you know. I do like to be aligned somewhat on what we're playing. I like systems and I like to to know that my partner will understand me. But we are talking a whole new level here. When I ask about follow-ups about, let's say, new minor forcing, I get hit with a description of every possibility <laughs> under the sun, along with a detailed recitation of 10 different hands where he employed various follow-up gadgets to new minor forcing. And of course, you know, within five seconds of the spiel, I'm, I'm lost, completely lost. And I say at the end, I didn't understand anything you just said. I'm sorry. So it's going to be interesting. He's a very good player. So I have utter confidence that what he's talking about is absolutely correct. It's just at the table. Will I know what is going on? I'm a little concerned. He he plays in a just a, I think a different um stratosphere than I do, than I'm used to. I'm sort of down here on the earth. And this is a different world. But I'm excited also because he's he's so good and I hope that I um I learn stuff. That's the goal. And maybe I'll have some good stories that I can tell you later on. So let's get back together later on and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, perfect. That sounds great. Wonderful. All right. Well, why don't we (laughs) sign off now and we'll check in again after the game. Okay. Stay tuned. (laughs) Hi again, Jocelyn. Oh, hi. (laughs) So we're back from your game. Yes. (laughs) How'd you go? Tell us all about it. (laughs) Well, it was very exciting. Yes. You know, I was very nervous and I was especially nervous because right before the game started, there was a little bit of drama at the club. And I am not going to go into that right now. I'll tell you another time. But let's just say it got me even more apprehensive about what was to come. (laughs) But I mean, it was really interesting. I have never played opposite somebody who just, you know, they know what every card, where every card is. And they know everything that you're doing and they can see all your mistakes. And it is like magic. I mean, he just knows. And I'm flailing about sometimes, (laughs) really unsure what to do. And you can just see it's so hard. It's so hard to be, you know, in the same universe as someone like me. Do you mean it's hard for your partner? Hard for my partner who knows what to do. Was he sitting there making faces or what was going on? Oh, he was really, he was trying very hard to be, and I know he was really, he was trying very hard to be very uh, properly behaved and comport himself as appropriate at a bridge club. But I, you know, I did make a couple of grievous errors. There was a time when I over preempted and, you know, he was like, you don't do that. You make them guess. And that is definitely a great lesson for me that you want to make them guess. 
you don't want to give them a clear direction of what is the right thing to do. You want to make them guess. And then another time when he said that I was only paying attention to what was in my hand and what I was capable of doing to set their contract, which I did. But had I been more cognizant of what he had, I would have realized we could have set their contract by even more. I will say, not that I'm a results-oriented person at all. We know I am not results-oriented. Ha ha. But both of those results, even though I did grievous errors, went fine for us from the point of view of our score. Well, that's nice. So that was a little bit reassuring to me, but it doesn't matter because it was terribly wrong. And I felt awful about making these mistakes. And I know that I will try not to make those same mistakes again, but I also know that I will. (laughs) (laughs) Despite my best intentions. Hi, I'm Midge from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I'm a listener supporter of Story Partner. What I love about the show is that it takes bridge seriously, but it doesn't take it too seriously. It's a lot of fun anecdotes and comments from the interviewers, and they ask great questions. They really keep the tone fun, but you learn a lot and have fun learning it. Here's how I supported the show. I went to their website and found a link on how to support the show, and it was very easy. If you're thinking about supporting the show, please do. We want to keep it on the air. Well, Jocelyn, on the theme of playing with new people and unfamiliar people, we've heard from David, who writes to us about turning up to a national tournament without a partner. He says he was doing the partnership desk thing, slim pickings, half an hour before the game. One curmudgeon in his 70s appeared and with just a glance and a sneer said he was looking for someone who was in his, quote, skill level. Mm. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) My 400 master points caused him to make perhaps well-founded assumptions. (laughs) Oh, my God. His wife told him to give the kid a chance. I was 64 at the time. (laughs) (laughs) He declined again. (laughs) Oh, no. Then at the last minute, a guy appeared who was willing to play with me. 15 minutes to put a card together and off we went. This was a daylight open pairs regionally rated game, but it was packed, perhaps 300 tables, with strong players who likely didn't make the first cut in the national games the day before, like me. At least I thought it was a strong crowd, which I love as I play better with strong competition. We came in second in the first session with about 62%. Partner was really surprised as nothing exciting happened. And then we came in third in the second session with about 62% again, which gave us an overall first and 40 gold points. Yes. I'm not an expert and never will be one, just a good intermediate. And I suspect that this will be my lifetime personal best. Indeed, I wasn't doing anything brilliant, just fewer mistakes than usual. My partner was a very good player who also made very few mistakes. Cheers, David. I absolutely love that. And I hope Mr. Curmudgeon is listening and knows that he missed out. But I also know that he must have just felt 10 feet tall. That's the expression that a woman who I saw had won some massive amount of master points for coming in first in one of these big events. She said she felt 10 feet tall and it was just the the greatest feeling. I, I don't know that feeling myself, having never gotten more than, I think, 10 master points at a time. That's pretty nice. Uh, uh. So, yes, he must have felt fabulous, and that's great. And it's just so nice to know that you can pick up a nice partner, even if someone sneers at you for being a useless whippersnapper at the age of 64. <laughs> <laughs> Our next letter is from Karen. She says, hi, Catherine and Jocelyn. I wanted to share an experience also from a tournament. I have 750 points, but was playing on a team with two people who had over 4,000 points. That put us into the top bracket of a two-day qualifier. 
I was pretty nervous about competing against some teams that I knew locally as being strong players, but my partner quickly informed me that those players weren't my biggest problem. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It turned out that there were three pro teams in our bracket. Mm -hmm. I had never competed against pros before. In fact, I only really knew these names from your podcast. Joe Grew was on one of the teams. Hey, so shout out to Joe. I'm sure he was very charming. I was scared out of my mind, but we managed to hold our own and came within one victory point of qualifying for the next day. Awesome. Most of the pros were really nice and their excellent table manners made the pain of being crushed more tolerable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, I had one really negative experience. On one hand, I opened one no trump, left-hand opponent passed, partner passed, and right-hand opponent said two clubs, which was alerted as clubs and a major. Having a nice five-card diamond suit, I said two diamonds, followed by a double by my left-hand opponent and a raise to three diamonds by my partner. When the dummy came down, I briefly wondered if I could have made three no trump. I had the ace of hearts and my partner had the ace of spades. However, it wouldn't have made three no trump and I did make three diamonds. When the hand was over, the pro started counting out loud, one, two, three, four, his client asked him what he was doing and he said, I'm trying to count the number of tricks she could have made in three no trump. I thought that was extremely obnoxious. If I could have made three no trump, they should have been happy that they just gained a lot of imps. For the rest of the boards, this probe berated his partner to the point where I seriously could not understand why anyone would pay to be treated so poorly. Since we didn't qualify, we played the pairs the next day and had a very nice time. Cheers. Karen. So it's a little bit of up and a little bit of down. Yeah, sometimes you just wonder why these people are so awful. I don't get it really. But, you know, it sounds like you did really well, Karen. Good job. Good job. You know, that reminds me of that time I mentioned to you a couple of months ago when we were very happy that we were in a six something doubled contract making and it turned out they had seven spades. Remember that one when the opponents were like, they had seven spades. <laughs> That's right. I do remember that. And um, yeah, we had seven spades, but we didn't know it. But we were like in six diamonds doubled and we made it, something like that. And it was just like that. It was like, it, it just feels so sour. Yes. It feels so mean spirited. And um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, well, I always say around people like that, just be glad you're not married to them. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we've heard from Carl, who says, Once I was dealt 27 points and partner opened, I bid six no trump and laid down my hand to claim seven no trump after the opening lead resolved the missing spade in my hand. It was the last hand of the tournament at the beginner table, so I got to have a walk-off home run in bridge. Love this game. Oh. <laughs> so if you have any fun stories about new partners or pickup partners at tournaments or just fun things that have happened at tournaments please do send them to us at sorrypartnerpodcast at gmail.com or on instagram or you could send us a voice message and these links are in the show notes and on the website at sorrypartner.com, along with some other good stuff. Coming up next, our interview with Sataj Hands. Australian champion Sataj Hands is a frequent representative on the Australian Open team. He has won 14 national titles, the 2012 NEC Cup in Japan, silver medal, at the 2011 World Transnational Championships and silver medal three times at the Asia Pacific Bridge Federation Championships. He has also had success at the U.S. Nationals, placing sixth at the 2012 Risinger, fifth at the 2014 Risinger, fifth at the 2015 Risinger, and third in the 2022 Roth Swiss teams. In 2017, his book, Battling the Best was awarded Bridge Book of the Year by the International Bridge Press Association. And in 2020, he won the IBPA Award for the Best Played Hand of the Year. 
we began by asking if he'd had any interesting hands lately. Well, I mean, the most interesting hand of last week actually featured my partner, who's also my wife, Sophie. She made a great bid, which um, our, your listeners may like, may enjoy. Um, she had some hand like queen third, spade, four low hearts, king doubleton diamond, and ace queen to four clubs. So I started with a strong club, and she responded two hearts, which showed 11 to 13 balanced. A bit unusual so far, but the theme that follows is quite interesting. So I bid three clubs, natural, and Sophie raised to four clubs. I bid four diamonds as a cubid. Now holding queen third in spades and four little hearts, she couldn't make a cubid in response. So she therefore signed off in five clubs. I continued with five hearts, which is another control bid. And now Sophie made the magic bid of five spades. Having already denied an ace or the king in spades, five spades had to show the queen of spades and the king of diamonds. Since I had denied the king of diamonds with my five heart bid, and Sophie had denied you know, an ace or king in the majors with her five club bid, for her to continue now in the quest for Grand Slam, it had to show both of those key cards. And that's all I was looking for, because opposite her hand, I had ace, king, jack of spades. I had no hearts. I had ace, jack to four diamonds, and king, jack to six, six clubs. So I bid seven clubs over five spades. And you know, uh, my unsuspecting LHO was looking at the ace, king of hearts and decided to double this. So I knew why he was doubling. So I sent that back with a bit of love, and that was 2660. So that was the most amusing hand of recent times. And uh, in fact, my opponent's partner said to him at the end of the hand quite nicely, she said, maybe you should have asked them what the bidding meant before you ventured with such a double. <laughs> it's like, oh, mm, at an ace. Anyways, yeah. What about you and Sophie? Did you two exchange a little knowing look? Well, we were having a horrible tournament, to be honest. Um, and it was just really nice for a hand like this to come up just at the very end. So you just finish the event and, you know, you have some good memories from it. Yeah, bridge can be like that, you know. There's many ways to feel happy about an event. And this was our triumph, I suppose, yeah. You play often with your wife. What is the best part of playing with Sophie? I think it's quite fun when you do well together, especially when we're on the same team. It's really a lot of fun to get success together. And we've had a fair amount of success in Australia playing together. In addition to playing with your wife, who else do you tend to play with regularly? Well, my regular partner of recent has been Peter Gill. And also I've been playing and been playing a bit more with Andy Hung in the future. They are both very, very strong, world-class players. What do you most like about playing with Peter Gill? I think Peter is very thorough. He's quite a professional, and especially in the defensive carding, I'm not as good as my peers in playing very accurate signals. You know, I like to do a bit of deception, which you need your partner to be on board to be doing such stuff. And Peter is very good at, when he gets on play in defense, he stops and thinks about the whole hand before he thinks about my signal. And I really like that about playing with him. What do you think Peter would say he likes the most about playing with you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess I like to play fairly simple and straightforward. So I tend to not create too many difficult problems for partner, either in the bidding or the play. I try to direct things down a simple path. Probably. That's very interesting because on the one hand, there was how much you like the deceptive plays that he's able to discern when you make because he thinks about the big picture and he doesn't get knocked off course, but maybe the opponents do. And yet what you think is your greatest strength is how reliable and straightforward you are as a player. I would say... Complexity is a bit different from deception. So an example of deception is this. We had a hand last week or so against Versace, and I made a false suit preference. I played 
the jack of hearts, which looks like I have an entry in spades. Peter got on play and instantly played a spade away from the king. And, you know, Versace, he looked at it and he looked at my jack of hearts and he rose with the ace and went down in a cold game that he could have made. That's deception. Whereas complexity versus simple is more like, you know, you have some auction and you're making some bids and you can keep confusing the matter or one of you can just suddenly take charge and bid four no trumps and be done with the hand. Or one of you can make a splinter and relinquish ownership. That's more simplicity. You are trying to avoid giving partner too many things to think about. You're trying to zone in on the essential points of a hand. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but... That makes perfect sense, is figuring out the essential puzzle to be solved for that hand and then focusing your efforts on that as opposed to muddying the other waters. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Is that something that you notice less experienced players struggle with? I think so. I think when you get really good at bridge, you just realize a lot quicker than less experienced players what the essential point of this hand is. And in any situation, you know, there may be like eight or 10 themes in play. The less experienced players will get muddled amongst the eight or 10, whereas the strong players will know the one or two or three that are really relevant to this hand and factor those in primarily. You know, they, they did a study in chess where they presented the same position to strong players and weaker players. And they found that the weaker players and the strong players in a lot of ways were similar. The one wasn't faster than the other, but it's just the stronger players knew to look at a smaller fraction of the number of possibilities, whereas the weaker players tended to get lost in the variety, and therefore clarity came a lot slower, if at all. And how does one go about developing the ability to figure out early on what is the main problem presented and puzzled to be solved by a particular hand? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. I would say that let's take just one aspect of the game, because the question is so broad. I mean, I could spend two hours talking about it. Let's take just a defense. If you're looking to get better at bridge and fast track that experience set, one of the things I think anyone should do is they should tell their partner from now on, we play only count signals and defense. So all your cards are count. And what will happen then is that, A, you don't have any ambiguities, partner doing count or attitude or suit preference. You know, what does this card mean? What does that mean? And a, there's no ambiguity, and B, then you start focusing on what the shape of the hand is, and you develop like what is called good culture. And a lot of these things that become easier as you become stronger are because you have good culture. So if you're playing with your partner and partner plays high to encourage, and therefore you switch to that suit, that's what I would say is bad culture. So if you want to become stronger, you know, if you someone played just count, you would start thinking about what the hand is, what the shape is. Do I need to play a heart? Do I need to play a spade? And that would be one way to fast track the experience. Is it because you would recognize when the count is not what you need? And so you would develop sort of more of a organic understanding of signals? I think you put that much better than I did. Yes. You've got to start thinking about in bridge on defense what the full hand is, rather than think about, should I play a heart or should I play a spade? And once you start thinking like that, you'll realize your level of play, it's, it's hard at first, but it, it gets better. I mean, I played, the first time I ever played for Australia, I played with Paul Marston and we played just count. And we were both very strong players. And while I don't recommend the just count signaling as a, you know, as the best way to signal, but it's one way of, addressing your question, Jocelyn, about what can the less experienced players do to try and come to the stage where they're thinking about the right things on a given hand. And when you say, just to be, just to be clear, when you say just count, that means to partners' leads as well as to the opponent's leads. Right, right. Right, okay. What else can people do to develop their game? I think in the bidding you should primarily, the best way that I fast track my experience is by studying the play of people at the very top levels. 
So not just watching view graph, but you know, after the view graph matches are over, all the hands are stored on this website called the view graph archives. And if you're a serious student of the game, you know, you could go and watch the high level matches and quickly click through what they did on different hands. And you will see any aspiring player sees a lot of situations that are unusual or new and where someone makes a bid that you don't, that you wouldn't make yourself. And there's a lot of value in just reviewing high level bridge and seeing how people approach it. That's another way to fast track your experience in bidding, I would say. Yep. What might your partner say is your weakest area of bridge? Well, it's quite clear. It's not mean. My biggest problem is when there are hands that are taking a lot of time, especially when I'm taking a lot of time, I will tend to get through my first decision on that hand well and maybe even the second one. But if there's the third one coming down at about trick nine or 10, sometimes I just totally lose the plot. Just concentration issue? I would say it's more like decision fatigue rather than concentration. You know, concentration, I would refer to, you know, the ability to keep yourself at a good level of play for a period of two hours. But when they have a series of decisions that are quite demanding and they're close to each other, then at some point I get fatigued and I do something that's really silly. And that's the biggest weakness in my game. Do you think that that's a concept that's often confused? People talk about concentration. Obviously, it's a huge part of bridge and incredibly important. But do you think there's a value in thinking about concentration as separate from decision fatigue, because I imagine how you address each of those issues might be slightly different. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like concentration is more like having long-term stamina, whereas this decision fatigue element I'm referring to is more like short-term stamina. It's like, you know, you're running a race and periods of it are little sprints and periods of it are a long distance race. I've spoken to some other very good players about this issue and quite a few others have said they struggle with the same problem of decision fatigue. I mean, we're all, you know, when you play on the international level, mostly concentration-wise, most people are at, uh, have a very um, strong skill set. But this element where you have to make a series of decisions close to each other and each of them are demanding, I know that a lot of other very good players struggle with this as well. Do you rely on instinct to get you through those situations? Or have you found that doesn't help? In general, I believe in instinct quite a lot. But when you're tired, your instinct breaks down. That's a common theme across lots of sporting domains. It's so interesting, Satash, because I thought the opposite was true, that in a sense, that's what you got from all your experience, that you don't have to second guess yourself. You can just go with that impulse and that, you know, that's what you've earned once you're playing at the very top level in any sport. I know you're a fan of squash and also of chess. And I just assumed that once someone is playing at those top levels, that they can free ride a little bit on some of their experience. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's true. For example, in the bidding, I bid very quickly. There's very few hands um, where I stop. And then when I stop, I know this is the time. That's my instinct. I know in certain competitive situations what to do. It comes to me, what you might call instinct, but it's really, it's the, you know, distillation in your brain of hundreds of hands, situations that are similar that you have processed in the past. And they all guide you toward the, this thing. The weakness I'm more referring to, the one where, you know, you have taken a few, they tend to be in the card play and there the instinct towards the end of a hand in card play is not as relevant because those problems are very concrete. You know, there's more like, are you going to pitch a heart? Or are you going to pitch a diamond? You know, are you going to rough with the nine of hearts or are you going to rough with the jack of hearts? They are more concrete problems and in concrete problems, instinct helps nobody, especially when you're tired. What do you love most about Bridge? I love most about Bridge is it exposes your greatest human weaknesses and it also brings out your greatest human strengths. To me, I mean, all over my, you know, uh, I'm not a professional, but all of my Bridge professional life, which I guess my international career, it's always been uh, very clear that, you know, if I have 
failings in life, they are there at the bridge table waiting to be solved. And if I have some strengths, they are also part of who I am as a bridge player. So yeah, that's what I love the most about the game. Can you give us some examples of how it translates? Okay. Um, so in strengths, I would say as a person, I don't get phased very easily. I am very um, resilient, to, especially to adversity. And I think that comes out in my bridge as well, in that you get bad results. They don't affect me the way they affect most other people. In terms of my weakness, I worked hard on one aspect, which was that I used to do a lot of so-called flashy plays, you know, trying to make these plays that get you in the bulletin, you know, super deceptive, especially declarer play. And they were just bad plays. And <laughs> once in a while I would get in the bulletin, but a lot of times I didn't. <laughs> and I think they stemmed from like a personal weakness, you know, the, the desire to show off, you know, the desire to be admired. And if you, I worked through that and I don't feel I have that weakness especially in my bridge. I don't know if I still have it in my life, but at least in my bridge, I managed to conquer that. And now I, I still have some flair where I may step out of the ordinary, but usually there is something concrete backing it. I'm not just doing it just to try and look smart. How did you work on it? Well, I think the standard recipe for any progress is to get to awareness. And you know, once you're aware you have a problem, you can do something about it. But most of the time, that's, that's one of the hardest challenges to, to accept that a certain aspect of your game is a serious flaw. You know, to, to compete effectively, you need to have a high level of confidence. You need to have a high level of belief. You need to, you know, think about. And so accepting flaws is, is, doesn't come very naturally to us. So I think once you have the awareness, then it's just a matter of, well, either mentally trying to come to terms with the, the nature of the weakness or to try and recreate it in training. What's the biggest slamozzle or muck-up you've ever made at the table? Well, there was a hand in the spin goal that I defend against um, Jeff Hampson. He was playing a game contract and I had a couple of tricky decisions early in the play, whether to you know, do this or do that. And I, was, I got past all of them and I got to a point where I knew he was going down. It was known. I was so sure that I almost claimed that he was going down. But I just kept playing on and I was, he was playing and I was playing quickly. And as the play went on, I just stopped paying attention to partner's discards. And I realized in the two-card endgame, I suddenly had to guess whether to keep a winning diamond or a winning heart in my hand. And I felt like such an idiot. You know, I'd solved these tricky problems early on, which involved partner getting squeezed and, you know, this and that. And then at the very end, I just had failed to keep track of what God's partner had discarded. And I let through a game. So that was a big, big schmuzzle. <laughs> and what did your partner say to you? Oh, Peter's great like that. In fact, all of my partners are great like that. You know, we just put the cards away, move on to the next turn. Did you have a laugh about it afterwards? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny for a while. Well, now we can laugh. Too soon, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> What's the funniest thing that's ever happened when you were playing bridge? Well, one incident comes to mind. There's a thing called a Leitner double, and that applies when the opponents bid a slam or a grand slam, and you can double, and that double says to partner, partner, I have a void somewhere, try and give me a rough at trick one. And there was a period about 20 years ago, I was studying a lot of world championship books. I went through, you know, high level bridge. And I noticed a recurring theme, which was that someone would bid a grand slam and it would go pass pass to, to some guy who would make a Leitner double, asking their partner to give them a rough. Now the opponents also know that you've asked to get a rough and the opponents would run to seven no trumps and it would make. And it just happened hand after hand after hand. So at the time I was playing with my friend Tony Nunn and I said to Tony, Tony, I think what we should play is that if it's any Grand Slam, we never double when we need a rough, but partner always tries to give us a rough, right? That way our opponents will never run to seven no trump and, you know, we'll be fine. And Tony says, okay. 
So we have had this agreement, and of course it doesn't come up. How often do your opponents bid a grand slam and you have a void? And a few years pass, and then finally we are playing the Bermuda Bowl in 2005. And guess what? It goes bid, 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 bid. Seven hearts pass, pass to me, and I have a club void. And of course I pass. And the next day, I read the bulletin, and in the bulletin they show the auction going to Jeff Mextroth, who doubled seven hearts, and they ran to seven no Trump. It going to Gear Helgemo, who doubled seven hearts, they ran to seven no Trump. Everyone doubled and everyone ran, so much so the datum on the hand was 2220. So that's the score for seven no Trump making. So everyone ran except for Sataj's hands, and he went seven hearts pass, pass to him, and he said pass, and my partner led a Trump. <laughs> I wanted to kill him. I wanted to kill him. But you still got a top. Well, but it, <laughs> <laughs> that was tragic. I mean, you know, all the way to Bermuda Bowl. Anyways, I have told that story in his presence countless times. <laughs> Every time I, I do a, you know, a strangling of his neck gesture. <laughs> what are some other funny things that have happened? Well, I mean, in my partnership with Andy... Funny things always seem to happen. Every time we play a tournament, we have one crazy wacko story that we just tell countless times again. Um, this one, I remember we were playing in India. We were playing for Australia. And Andy and I like having not too much system. So much so that there's this auction that was in the notes which said, if one of us opens a diamond and the opponents overcall a heart and our partner bids two spades, the bid does not exist. Right. So we have like three pages of system notes, you know, and within that is a little table in which it says diamond a heart, two spades does not exist. And so then we are playing for Australia in this tournament in India. And of course, the bidding goes a diamond from me, a heart by them. And Andy chips in a little two spade bid. And, I, and my opponents ask me what it is. And I say, well, you know, the notes say it does not exist. So say, well, what do you think? And, you know, I guess I figure that given that we play fairly straightforward, he's got spades. And um, that's what happened. And later on, I asked him, Andy, why did you do this to me? He said, well, you know, it's wanted something funny to happen. Nothing funny had happened for a while. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're going into the, imagine, the world of, of imaginary numbers and black holes just to entertain each other. Yeah. That's yeah, funny. well, I mean, this always things seem to happen. Living or dead, who would you have on your dream team? Well, I know that I would like to have Bob Hammond on the team. I think Bob is one of the greatest bridge players who's ever lived. I have learned a lot from his book, At the Table. And as teammates, I think Mextra Throdwell would be an easy pick for my first pair. And from a second pair, I'd probably go for Greco Hampson. So yeah, that'd be my dream team. I mean, I would also say that all of these players are what I would call clean players. You know, at all levels of bridge and especially at the high levels, there are some players who are quite successful with big names, but who have questions on their ethics and character. Whereas all of these players I, I would like on my dream team would be what I would call are clean players. They don't go out of their way to illegally try and help partner a little bit. Is there a hot button issue that you are particularly passionate about and dedicated to when it comes to bridge? Well, I'm passionate about the subject of cheating. In fact, in a recent final of the nationals of, uh, in the U.S., there were you know, a number of known cheats playing, and that's a tragedy. Sadly, it's so difficult to convict people you know, number of number of people have put in hundreds of hours. Uh, you know, people like Boya Broglin, Steve Weinstein, David Gold. I mean, I, I don't even know who Ishmael Del Monte. Um, but it's very difficult to achieve convictions because bridge, you know, is a, such a game where there's such a wide array of options one can take on any given hand. You know, it's it's very hard to nail it down. Have you had the experience where you're playing and you know in your bones that someone's cheating and you can either see it or you just know it, but you can't see it. I know that there's no doubt many games where you've played against people who've later been caught out at cheating and may have been cheating when they were playing against you. But have you had that experience at the table where you just know it? 
Well, there was a hand I had against uh, Baliki Zuzinski many years ago where I opened a diamond and my partner bid a spade and I bid two clubs and it went all pass. And my screen mate made the opening lead and then he looked at me and he said, one, four, 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 referring to my shape. And, you know, when you open a diamond and you read the two clubs, you're very unlikely to be one, four, four, four. You usually have five diamonds and four clubs and sometimes, you know, a few other shapes. And I looked at the hand record later on. And in the context of the bidding and context of the signal his partner had given him a trick one, I knew that there was no way he could have worked out that that was my specific shape. There's no way anyone had that sort of information. And that really raised some alarm bells in my mind, and I felt that there was something afoot there. What could it have been, though? Well, Balik Kusuzinski, the allegations include that they were signaling, you know, count signals and attitude at the same time, and they were telling partner all about the whole hand. And one of the allegations was that in one of the videos, one of them touches dummy with his fingers and signals his own distribution to partner at the same time. So why do you think that he would have said that to you? Because in a sense... He was giving away that he he did know something. Yeah, it it was, I think he was surprised because, you know, an auction like that, diamond, a spade, two clubs, is you, in your mind, I mean, at my level, like when I play and, and the bidding goes, diamond, pass a spade, pass two clubs from my opponents, in my mind defaults to the shape, the guy's shape is one spade, three hearts, five diamonds and four clubs. That's the most likely shape. And when it emerges, I'm one, four, four, four instead, it comes as a bit of a surprise to you do you think it's because if they were cheating, he had not put it together and so he was surprised himself? Yeah, quite possibly. It's hard to know. But I, you know, I don't know what his motivations were or why he asked that question, but I did think it was a bit suspicious. And other than that, look, I haven't ever felt that someone against us is blatantly, obviously cheating. But when the whole crusade started, you know, six or seven years ago, when with the help of Boya and a bunch of others who put in lots of hours to unmask, I suppose, all the main cheats. It came as a big surprise to me at the time. Mm. Disappointing. Yeah, more in more than disappointing. It's tragic, you know. It's the world championships, the big American nationals have been tainted for so many years. And imagine all the people who could have, you know, I mean, I personally have lost to a lot of the cheats many times in knockout matches, but not just, you know us, but how much damage they have done to the lives of others. Yeah. And the fact that some of them still continue to play, that is pretty sad. What is something that people could do about this? Well, perhaps all us bridge players need to accept that to clean up the game, we need to sign away our rights to the courts and hand off all of the cheating investigations to like a small committee that everyone trusts and their judgment is final. That's going to go over. <laughs> That's going to go over not very well. No. <laughs> Lead balloon. <laughs> I know. But sadly, I mean, and there may be some, you know, casualties of that, but. Would you, would you be a, a casualty if you felt that that process was put in place? Would you be okay with that? No, I would be okay with that. You know, I have nothing to hide. And I have a faith that if top-level players were assessing my play over a period of time, they would find enough evidence of stupid things I've done, which I wouldn't be if I was cheating. <laughs> they would say, no way. <laughs> right. That's always been my defense. If I were cheating, do you think that my scores would be this bad? <laughs> Don't you think they'd be better? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, unless we have... Unless we shorten the so-called judicial process, I can't see a solution to some of these cheats continuing to play and continuing to corrupt our game. Do you have a favorite convention or gadget that you really like to play? Yeah, the convention that I like the most are splinters. So in any auction, if you can make a splinter bid that tells partner what your shortness is and also somehow limits your high card range, that's probably the best bid you can make in any auction. I personally like it because it, I like bids that relinquish control. You make a bid like that, after that, you just have to sit down there and respond key cards, you know? And partner is very well placed to 
evaluate how the two hands fit together and determine the path forward. So yeah, I like splinters. Opposite a five card major opening, do you require four cards to make a splinter or is three acceptable? I like four because the, when you're trying to rough tricks in one hand, the fourth trump can make a huge difference. And if you leave it ambiguous as responder can have either three or four cards, that doesn't give the opener the sort of certainty that is needed in such auctions. I was having a look at your bridge winners page and on that you say that your favorite convention is filthy preempts at vulnerable. And that is <laughs> just so evocative. Oh no, that's true actually. I mean, I wish I'd thought of that at the time. We've been doing this for a long time now. When you are dealer favorable, so you are white, the opponents are red, and you are dealer. I like to play two of a major there is zero to six points and usually a five card suit. And I've been doing this for a long time with a lot of success and it has not caught on. So it's a good tip <laughs> for anyone who wants to make it part of their game. <laughs> What about conventions that you're less of a fan of or that you just really do not like? I don't have too many strong opinions. I mean, in general, I'm quite skeptical of new conventions because people tend to not accept the cost. You know, any artificial bid comes with a corresponding cost. And that cost is not usually not recognized by the advocates of the convention or the followers of it. But other than that sort of general sentiment, I don't have any strong opinions about any mainstream convention that's, you know. What's the best bridge advice or tip that you've ever been given or that you have to share with our audience? I think in terms of playing bridge, the most important advice is to count. Count the shape, count the high cards, count the tricks, count partner shape, declarer shape, and find a partner commit to a partner, focus on your own mistakes and not your partners. That's the way to success in bridge. So Taj, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so great talking to you. Thank you so much. It's been terrific. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks, Jocelyn. I've enjoyed it too. And that's the show. Many thanks to our guest, Sataj Hands. Thank you also to our Sorry Partner Posse of listener supporters who make the show possible. Sorry Partner is produced by Catherine Harris with production assistance from Paul Chirasso and Jade Gray. Our theme music was composed by Jocelyn Starts and produced by Daniel Graboy. Send your bridge stories and comments to sorrypartnerpodcast at gmail.com or at sorrypartnerpodcast on Instagram or send us a voice message. And please consider supporting the show. These links and a link to our discount offers and merch store are under the episode description in your app, on the website at sorrypartner.com, or wherever you like to listen. We'd love to hear from you, but be nice. Or we'll call the director. Until next week, play well. May all your finesses be on side. And remember, as Sataj says, focus on your mistakes, not on your partners. That's the way to success at Bridge. Thank you, partner. Thank you, partner. Bye. Bye. <laughs>